Hello and welcome back to Keep Talking, a community dialogue about mental health. My name is Gay Maxwell and I'm the manager of the Office of Continuing Education at the Brattleboro Retreat. The Brattleboro Retreat is a 183-year-old addictions and mental health hospital located in southeastern Vermont. It serves adults, adolescents, and children in a variety of inpatient, outpatient, and partial hospitalization settings. The Brattleboro Retreat provides care and courage when being human hurts. Today in the BCTV studio, I have Dr. Randy Frost, who is kind enough to have driven up from North Hampton, Massachusetts today to spend time with us and to talk about compulsive hoarding disorder. Uh, Dr. Frost is a international expert on the subject of compulsive uh, hoarding disorder, and uh, his resume is about as tall, well, maybe twice as tall as he is, and that's really tall. So I, um, I'm going to boil it down to a few points. Dr. Frost is a, um, a professor at Smith College in Northampton, Mass. He's a professor of psychology. Um, he is also the, a prolific author about the subject of compulsive hoarding disorder. He has, uh, including these two books, Buried in Treasures, Help for the Compulsive, Acquiring, Saving, and Hoarding. And he also has written Stuff, Compulsive Hoarding and the Meaning of Things. What I've been told is, is that this book is particularly um, uh, informative for people who might not know a whole lot about psychology, mm -hmm. um, but really kind of want to know a little bit more about this subject. So um, stuff, the compulsive hoarding, and the meaning of things. Um, Dr. Frost, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. My oh, pleasure. Oh, great. It, is there anything I left out that I should have I, said I about so. you? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let's start off with a question that I'm sure a lot of people have who don't um, who've heard about compulsive hoarding disorder and maybe have watched some of the more extreme cases on television and might be um, really uh, interested, but at the same time have a lot of misconceptions about it. Um, uh, I, we all know people who have collections, for instance. We know um, people have art collections. They have CD collections. They have um, uh, vinyl collections. Now that's pretty big. Let's say 20s vintage clothing. I could be accused of having a yarn collection, especially when I go by webs in Northampton. But I've been uh, accused of that. So, But what is the difference between... Uh, someone who is a collector and someone who might have compulsive hoarding disorder? Well, there are a number of differences. There are some similarities as well. The, the nature of the attachments to possessions, the things we own, is sometimes similar in people who are collectors versus people who have hoarding problems. Mm -hmm. The difference comes about in the intensity of the attachment and the difficulty with managing the possessions. Mm -hmm. So. Compulsive hoarding or hoarding disorder really is composed of three different things. First of all, there's a disorder related to acquisition. That ex uh, the acquisition is excessive. People buy and pick up free things and, and, and accumulate things to a much greater extent than most people do. The second is difficulty discarding. Once things come into people's homes, it's very difficult for them to let them go. And we can talk about some of the reasons why. The third feature has to do with the ability to manage the possessions, that the possessions typically are in a cluttered uh, um, uh, arrangement, most of the time filling the middle of the room, and oftentimes not filling up places like cupboards and, and dressers where things should be. Uh, for instance, one of the, one of the people in the, in the book stuff is someone who, um, whose her home was absolutely packed. Her bedroom, her clothes were on top of the dresser all the way to the ceiling but her dresser drawers were empty. Mm. And what she said was, if I put the clothes in the drawer, I've, I'll forget that I have them. I won't see them. I need to see them in order to remember. So one of the things that, one of the, one of the attachments that we see in hoarding, one of the things that, that attaches people to their things is that these objects are reminders for them. They're kind of memory tags for things. Mm -hmm. And we see that repeatedly. People wonder about, is this really a mental health disorder? I mean, how did it get classified as a mental health disorder? Or is it just, you know, two of the 
seven deadly sins, sloth and um, you know greed thrown yeah. together. Yeah. You know, what yeah. is the difference? Yeah. It, it used to be that hoarding was thought of as a subtype of obsessive compulsive disorder. Hmm. Um, and over the course of the last 20 years or so, the research on this disorder has, has bloomed. And, and what we see is that it, it really is distinct from obsessive compulsive disorder. The reason it's a disorder is that it interferes with the function in people's lives. The, the people's ability to use their homes, the spaces, the living spaces in the homes, in the ways in which they were designed. And this can be, it, while it sounds like it's sort of just some messiness and so forth, it really can be a pretty serious problem. There's a recent study done in Australia of looking at residential house fires in the state of Victoria. Mm. And what they discovered was that the, only a small percentage of residential house fires was associated with hoarding. But those house fires where the home was hoarded accounted for 24% of fire-related deaths. Wow. And so it's not only a danger to the person living there, but it's also a danger to first responders as well. And now in places like New York City, uh, they, they mark homes that they know have a hoarding problem as, as call your residence, based on a famous case back in the 40s. Oh, yes. and, and, and those are tags. So if, if a fire occurs there, firefighters know what they're faced with when they get there. Yeah, because it's dangerous. Because it's dangerous for, for them. firefighters yes. as well, because they could exactly. get caught under um, piles of stuff. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. So speaking of Australia and, uh, and the United States, is this a disorder that is prevalent only in a consumer-driven, um, industrialized world, or does it cover a, a wide variety of cultures and, and nationalities? Yeah, it's a great question. It, there's not a lot of good evidence about it. We do know that it exists virtually everywhere. So even in third world countries, we see this behavior. What we don't know is if it's as prevalent as it is here. Mm -hmm. So in this country, somewhere between one and a half and six percent of the population suffers from hoarding. There are about a half a dozen or more epidemiological studies looking at prevalence rates. Each one defines hoarding a little bit differently, some more stringently than others. But in, by and large, they, the, the, the window is somewhere between one and a half and six percent. Of the general population. Of the general population, population. yeah. Because there, you know, I saw this study in, um, Scientific American, they said it was somewhere between uh, 5 million and 14 million in the United States. There was a report in the Washington Post that it, in, yeah. in 2016 that said it was 19 million. I wondered yeah. how accurate yeah. those numbers can be. Yeah, the, the Scientific American article, I think, picked the, the, the window from 1.5 to 5 percent, which was what the early epidemiological studies suggested. And that would make it between 5 and about 14, 15 million, something like mm -hmm. that. The, the 19 million is about 6 percent of the U.S. population. So that figure must have come from the other study uh, that, that found 6 percent uh, of the population with this problem. Well, you have done a tremendous amount of research in this area, and back from the 1990s. Can you identify for me um, where, I mean, everybody is different, and I'm sure everybody with uh, a hoarding problem is different, but have you been able to um, uh, card the wolves and, and see what are the similarities uh, among this uh, population? Yeah, what we've been able to do is identify a number of features that go into this disorder. And first of all, we know that this is partly genetic. That uh, if you have a family member who's had this problem, you're more likely to develop this problem. Mm -hmm. um, number two, there are some background variables we see that are important here. Um, about half of people with this disorder are clinically depressed. A large number have anxiety disorders, so there's a lot of comorbidity here with other, disorder, other mental health disorders. Mm -hmm. um, we see also some, pro some processing problems, some information processing problems among these folks. That is, it appears as though the way in which their brain is working is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So first of all, there are problems with attention. 
uh, a lot of attention deficit. Yes, I, I, um, I noticed in the research I did that ADHD was... ADHD is, is very big mm -hmm. in this population, and it, it shows up in a couple of ways. Mm -hmm. One is a distractibility, especially when a task requires a great deal of effort. People with ADHD, when, they, when they're faced with something that's hard and they have to think carefully about it, that's when the, the, the distractibility really takes over. And so we see that a lot in hoarding. The other thing we see is almost the opposite problem, where people get narrowly focused on something. And for people with hoarding disorder, that usually happens when they're in some kind of acquiring episode or acquiring environment, where they see something they want, and their, their, their focus of attention gets so narrow mm -hmm that they kind of lose track of the context of their life. So they forget about the fact that they don't have the money to buy this, mm -hmm. they don't have the place to store it, and they already have three of them at home. That information, is, it's like it's not available to it's, them. It's almost uh, part of what you were talking about before, about the attachment issue. Exactly. That, you, that there's an over-focus I'm, you know, I on want this that object, thing. Yes. on this object, right. right, and so and so that attention is a part of it. Another information processing problem we see, and this goes directly to the ability to organize things, is a difficulty categorizing things. Mm -hmm. Now, most of us live our lives categorically. We get an electricity bill, and we take that bill and we put it with our other electricity bills or with utility bills in a folder somewhere. If we want to find that individual member of that category, we go to that category and we pick it out. But people with hoarding problems don't organize their world that way. Their world is organized visually and spatially. So the electricity bill would go on top of the pile a little over to the left, and now if they want to find it, they, they reference a map that's in their head. Of, of, of where it is in this pile of things. Mm -hmm. And so their world, especially the objects in their world, are organized visually and spatially rather than categorically. I see. Now, I, I do that on my desktop. I have piles of things. I know what's there because I remember the pile, putting them in the pile. But if I did that with everything I owned, it would be impossible to mm -hmm. operate. And that's what happens. Is that, those are some of the examples of the information process. Is there a tipping see. point where, I mean, where it, uh, is there a tipping point where it becomes unmanageable? Because it sounds almost like they build a map with objects. I, I may be off on that, correct me if I'm wrong. And then all of a sudden the map gets so uh, uh, clustered or cluttered yeah. Yeah. It, that they can't find their way anymore. It, yeah, that's pretty accurate that, that, that it, the, the, the pile in the middle grows so much mm -hmm. that they kind of lose track. But it's remarkable how well they can remember the things that are in there. And a couple of cases of people who had almost a perfect image of a pile of things and they could a, a, a huge room just filled with all kinds of things they walk into the room would know instantly whether someone's been in there and moved anything mm. and it's 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 like having this three-dimensional map and picture that they can reference when they come in and uh, into the room and know that everything is still there does that also um uh, translate into a sense of identity of yourself um, as having these particular items that, uh, that yeah. make you you? <laughs> it, 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 it's, it, it, that's a large part of that. That has more to do with the nature of the attachments, the emotional attachments mm -hmm. to things. Than the, so the information processing is one piece of it. Yes. The next piece is the nature of these attachments. Now, is it unusual? Well, possessions have a magical quality for all of us. They, it, the things we own have meaning that goes well beyond the physical characteristics of the object, like the, a ticket stub to a favorite concert. That ticket stub's no different than any other ticket stub to the concert, but its meaning is the, the meaning that you put into it. It's your sentimental attachment. It's, it contains your memory of that event, and seeing the ticket brings that memory back. Mm -hmm. And what we see in hoarding is that that same phenomena that all of us experience, but with greater intensity and applied to a large number of things. Mm -hmm. So for instance, one of, the, one of the people we worked with is a woman who we were, I was working with her one day on, on papers. And we had a box of papers she wanted to keep and a box she was gonna recycle. And she picked up a, an ATM envelope out of the pile. And it's an envelope she got five years ago from an ATM machine. On the back, she had written 
how she spent the money that came in the envelope. The envelope was empty. She put it in the recycle box and she started to cry. And what she said was, it feels like I'm losing that day in my life. Mm. And if I lose too much, there'll be nothing left of me. Mm -hmm. So this was, a, this was like a key for her that opened the memory for that day. And this object was, in a sense, her personal history. And her sense was that if she threw this away, she would lose that personal history and therefore that part of herself. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly, we kept going with this exercise, and, and um, a few minutes later, I asked her, well, how do you feel now about the envelope? And what she said was, well, you know, that wasn't such a good day. And so it was okay mm -hmm. with her then. Mm -hmm. But the initial reaction was this, this real emotional kind of feeling of loss mm -hmm. and, a, and a sense of I her identity kind of crumbling somehow. So what brings people for help? Um, I just wonder, is, is, what does it take to recognize in oneself the problem and want to get some help with it? Yeah, there, there are two things that, that, that seem to bring people for help. One is some kind of recognition of the function they've lost in their lives. What can't I do anymore? I can't cook. I can't, I can't sleep in my bed. I can't sit on my, my couch. You know, that, that kind of loss of function. That's one thing that brings people in. Another is pressure. Pressure from family members, pressure from authorities of one sort or another, health department, um, and, and so forth. So those are the two things that really bring people in. Most people who have this problem recognize there's something wrong. Um, we, depending on, on who you talk to, people in, in health departments, for instance, when you talk to them about a hoarding problem, they, they talk about people who don't have any insight, who don't have any recognition that this is a problem. That's a small portion of these folks. And even, even among those folks, there is some degree of ambivalence here because almost everyone I've met who's got a hoarding problem recognizes that other people somehow um, think badly of them because of the way they live. And so they have this sense of shame. Mm -hmm. and, and what that shame does is it, it turns into isolation. Yes. And so what happens is that they guard themselves against being seen by other people. And they won't let anyone into their home. And they stop having relatives come and visit. And that's tied also into the into reactions of other people. So for the most part, people who, who come in for treatment have suffered decades worth of criticism um, and pressure from family members. And some, that's, that gets in the way of the ability to recognize this is a problem and do something about it. Mm -hmm. And that, that tremendous um, cycle of shame and isolation yeah. must be extremely painful. Yeah. yeah. What we see with people with this problem is that they are less likely to get married, more likely to get divorced, very likely to be alone with a very small circle of friends. Mm -hmm. Speaking of <laughs> um, likelihood of getting divorced, what is it, um, if, if I'm living <laughs> with a person who has this problem, how do, how do I, is it going to take me a long time to figure that out? Or is it, you know, how do I recognize that this has become uh, beyond messy and disorganized? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think most family members can do know when it's gone, when it's gone beyond just mm -hmm. sort of normal messiness. And it, it, it all boils down to how much of the living space is functional. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the things that, that, that works to destroy a relationship, a family relationship, when this happens. And that's why we see high divorce or separation rates among people with hoarding disorder. The people who are successful at navigating this in families typically have some way of negotiating space. And so the person with the hoarding problem may have control over a certain part of the house. Mm -hmm. And the other family member may, if they can control the main living areas of the house and keep the clutter to a minimum, then the relationship has a chance of, of lasting. Mm -hmm. But often it's really hard to do and, and battles develop. And those battles turn into a real marital strife. 
Is, um, and so what can family members do? I mean, are there things, is this a tough love situation or rather, is that the worst thing you can do? Yeah, the worst thing you could do is to throw the person's stuff out when they're not there, or they don't know, or insist that it be thrown out. What we see when this happens is that the, the, um, the, the, the relationship will fracture, number one, and the stuff, stuff will come back in. So it's really not a question. Uh, decluttering or uncluttering a, 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 a hoarded home is not an effective way of dealing with the problem. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is you can change the, the situation, you can change the physical space temporarily, but since you haven't changed the behavior, that space is gonna fill up again in short order. For family members, the first thing to do is, is to try to put themselves in that person's shoes. How do you, how, how do they understand? Uh, how do they relate to each of these objects? Why is it important to them? What is the meaning? And then get them to reflect on that meaning with respect to the function that is taken up by that meaning. So in other words, uh, if I want to keep something, okay, there's a cost to keeping that thing. And the cost to keeping that thing is that I don't have the space to use in a different way. And so if you can engage the person in a conversation that recognizes and appreciates the meaning of the object, but try to balance it against the cost of keeping that object, then there, that opens a dialogue for the person to start thinking differently about their possessions. Mm -hmm. what, how do you find that uh, uh, people who are struggling with hoarding explain this to themselves and try to explain it to others? For the most part, people, people who I talk to, and it, it all depends on how, how you begin the conversation. So for me, my, my view of this is I really want to know, I'm really curious about the nature of the attachment that people have to possessions. And once you, once you convey that kind of curiosity, People will open up and talk about the meaning of these things, and that will get them to the point of, of saying, well, I do have a lot of clutter, and there are things I can't do, and so forth. And that's what, that's what will open people up. But if I go to the door, and I'm a health department, and I say, you know, we at the health department don't like the way you're living, and we think you should change the way you're living, and we're going to make you change the way you're living. Mm -hmm. Then that shuts down the conversation, and the person becomes defensive, and appears not to recognize that there's a real problem. So the issue of how, how, how much the person can recognize there's a problem, mm -hmm. how much insight they have, really is based on the nature of the conversation, and how it starts, and how it progresses. Wow. So do you, have you done work with health departments say to help them with these exchange. I mean, I know that there's, uh, the eviction becomes a, a really scary thing. Or for instance, child custody. Um, if, the, if, a, if a home has become so dangerous that family services is saying, you know, we, the kids can't live here anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, uh, health departments and other agencies have changed dramatically over the course of the last 20 years in their approach to hoarding. Mm -hmm. And now there are hoarding task forces that exist around the country. There are, oh, at last count, something like 120 wow. different hoarding task forces around the country focused on this. And these task forces are made up of not just mental health professionals, but people from the health department, people from adult serv uh, services, mm -hmm. from child services, uh, and so forth. And, and they they sit around the table and they figure out strategies for dealing with this problem on a community-wide basis, mm -hmm. which is what it, what it means. This is much more than a mental health problem. Mm -hmm. This is a problem that affects other areas of life and other parts of the community. Mm -hmm. And so the solution sometimes involves these other parts as well as mental health. When you have worked with families, how do you tell them ways that they can take care of themselves? How can they take care of themselves? Yeah, yeah. It, that's, the, that's one of the most important things for a family member mm -hmm. is to make sure that they are somehow emotionally supported mm -hmm. so that that, that, that kind of um, uh, criticism is not there because that, it, it, the criticism of a family member with hoarding disorder will get you nowhere. And it's hard for people to accept that because in a family context, there, there is a sense in which people 
think if I if I just keep telling this person, if I just keep criticizing it, their behavior will change. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't happen in this case. It so, doesn't happen ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's probably true. Yeah. Criticism is not a good idea yeah. <laughs> in yeah. general. Yeah, but it is important for pe for p family members to be able to to protect their own emotional well-being. And sometimes that's hard, particularly if a home has, is completely full and they've got no space for themselves. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a real problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I'm wondering where people go for help. How, what, um, obviously, you've, you've worked in programs or created programs. Um, right now, if somebody comes to you and says, I need help with this problem, do you refer them somewhere? Are there, are there and, and what yeah. ways work? What yeah. are the things that you think work the best? Uh, where I send them, the first place I, I send them is to the International OCD Foundation website. The ocfoundation.org. We'll make sure that's um, up on the screen when okay. this gets uh, okay. viewed. Good. Yeah, they, they, on that website is a, a, a therapist finder. Mm -hmm. And it covers the whole country and internationally. And so that's the first place to go. And there you're more likely to find a mental health professional who's been trained in um, how to treat hoarding. We've done a number of workshops with therapists around the country. Um, and when they finish, they get certified with a uh, behavior therapy training institute. Oh, that's wonderful. That they've been through our training for, mm -hmm. for hoarding. So the International OCD Foundation is, is step one because they, they, can, they can tell you in a, within a 20 mile radius if there's a therapist who knows how to deal with this. Mm -hmm. Second thing is to check the local area for hoarding task force mm -hmm. because many hoarding task forces keep um, records of resources. Uh, for mental health professionals as other, and other professionals. There are a couple of other professions besides therapists. Um, uh, professional organizers often are very helpful in this context. There's a special group of professional organizers called the Institute for Chronic Disorganization. Oh. And they focus mostly on hoarding cases. Oh, I had no idea about that. Yeah. I have seen um, in the research I did that there are buried in treasures uh, support groups. Is that something that uh, I, I don't know how many the prevalence of them or is this a self-starting yeah. kind of uh, yeah. group? Yeah, this is, this is something that we started a number of years ago because there were so few therapists who knew how to treat this. Mm -hmm. Um, we started running the Buried in Treasures workshops. Buried in Treasures workshops are 16 session workshops. B based basically on this based book. Based on the book, on Buried in Treasures. Treasures. And what, what is done in the workshop is each week is a different chapter of the book. It's a self-help book for dealing with hoarding and acquiring problems and clutter. Uh, and each week focuses on a different chapter. It's highly scripted. It's, I wouldn't describe it as a support group. It's mm -hmm. more of an action-oriented group. Uh -huh. um, so most of the time there's homework to do in between sessions. There's check-ins about what people were able to do. Uh, and and we've, been, we've been doing some research on the effectiveness of the Brady and Treasures Workshop. And it looks like it's, it's re very promising. From what mm. we're seeing, it looks like uh, participating in Barry and Treasures Workshop is almost as good as being in therapy. For Excellent. Hoarding. Barry and Treasures Workshops are run by uh, virtually anyone. We have a number of places where peers are running. That is, people with lived experience of hoarding disorder are running the Barry and Treasures Workshops. Uh, and the, the, the outcomes look as good as if it's run by a clinician. Uh, and these are running around the country, and in fact, uh, in many other countries in the world as well. So I don't know how many there are going on, but there are a lot. We have a, a, a facilitator's guide. So it's a, it's a very detailed um, guide for how to run this workshop, all the way down to how many pens and pencils you need to run it. So very detailed. Wow. Uh, if people are interested, they can contact me, okay. uh, and I can I can send them the facilitator's oh, guide. Oh, wonderful! So anyone can set this up and run it. We do. We often do trainings for facilitators to run this. Uh, Excellent. People are interested. Wow, um, we're getting close to the end, and I want to just um, check in with a final question for you. Um, well, actually, two final questions. Um, have you seen people get better? and feel better and have their lives change? Yes, 
Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Both both with buried in treasures and in therapy, um, we do see this. We're, we're now, one of the things we're doing in our buried in treasures research is we're starting to look at the effect the program has on hope. Mm -hmm. Because when people, when people come in with this problem, for the most part, they've struggled for decades. They've been criticized for decades. They feel such shame and they, see, they have no hope. Mm -hmm. And so one of the first things we can do is to get them to see how they, the, how they can change. And even with a little change, that, that their level of hope improves. And that's key to getting them motivated to keep going. This takes a long time. Mm -hmm. This takes a long time to work through this problem. Mm -hmm. Um, well, those attachments are deep. The attachments are deep, and you have to work on the attachments before really worrying about the clutter. So what, what sometimes happens is pe people worry about uh, the treatment because we focus on one object at a time. Mm -hmm. And you know, in, in a home that's completely full, working with one object at a time is not going to unclutter very quickly. Mm -hmm. But the, the real issue is it's, it's these attachments that have to change first. And once mm -hmm. those change, then you can get rid of the clutter. And you also then have the practice. And then you have the practice, you, you, you exactly. You have the practice as well. Yeah. Last question. You've worked with um, people with uh, this problem for decades. What have you, um, what has been most a, 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 admirable about this um, uh, population? You know, it's an interesting question. I, you know, I think after, after spending this much time studying these folks, getting to know so many of them, I think that this is a form of giftedness. Mm. It, is, it, it reflects an ability to see possessions in a different way. In a, in a creative way. And, and one of the things we haven't talked about is, is the attachments related to aesthetics. There's, a, there's an aesthetic sensitivity here, people's ability to recognize the beauty in objects that most of us don't. Mm -hmm. uh, an example, uh, one, of the, one of the people in, in the book stuff um, is, a, is a woman, really a, just a wonderful person. And I, 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 I visited her many times as we worked through treatment. and. Um, I, as I showed up one day, she, she said, I've got to show you something. She ran in the other room and came back with a large, clear plastic bag filled with bottle caps. Mm -hmm. And she said, look at these bottle caps. Aren't they beautiful? Look at the shape and the color and the texture. And I realized at that moment that I, my aesthetic sensitivity was next to nothing. Mm -hmm. Because when I see a bottle cap without a bottle, I just think of trash. Mm -hmm. But for her, it was a whole world of beauty. Mm. And in some ways, maybe that reflects a, a kind of giftedness to, to see the beauty in the world, to see the beauty in nature, mm -hmm. and not want to waste it. Not yeah, <laughs> that's lovely. That's lovely. Dr. Frost, thank you so much. For well, thank you for having giving me. your time, and I can't wait to hear your presentation. I didn't even mention that, that you're presenting to yes. um, uh, mental health uh, professionals through the Office of Continuing Education on Friday, March 23rd, and that's going to happen in uh, Agawam, Mass., um, at the Crestview Country Club. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that. And this is, um, I think, the fourth time that you've come it, and presented is, yes. at the retreat, and so, yeah. at least in my tenure. Uh -huh. So I'm thrilled to have you back. So well, I'm thank you very much. Forward, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to thanks again. And this is another episode of Keep Talking that's coming to a close. Thank you so much for joining us. And I want to thank the BCTV community. They are so great with helping us with this. I couldn't do it without them. Um, and please join us again. Thanks. Thank you.